a joke. But it is summertime, and uh, I want to. We're going to begin a series today called "Summer at Life Church," and and basically what we want to do is just kind of talk about some things that I think would be helpful to us throughout the summer. You know, how many of you know that <clears throat> summer is typically a time that, in our mind, it's a time that, hey, you know, it's I get to kick back, I get to relax, I get to disconnect. Um, it's a time that most pastors anticipate, you know, that what we call the summer slump where attendance goes down because, um, um, you know, people are traveling, vacation, and just simply taking maybe more Sundays off than normal. And, um, and look, I get all that, love to do vacations, and, and we do those our, uh, as a family ourselves. And, but I, I think it's important, and, and what I want to do is kind of share some topics throughout the summer where maybe... We can end the summer and, you know, in the fall and get ready to go back uh, rested physically, but not necessarily set back spiritually. I think summer can be a time where we can disconnect and rest physically, but, um, but it can be also, it should be a time where we don't necessarily take a spiritual vacation. How I many you know you take a spiritual vacation and the enemy will take advantage of that in your life? I assure you. So if you have your app, you have the sermon notes open, uh, you can get ready to, to follow along with me. And uh, I want to read in Matthew chapter 11, a very, one of my favorite verses <clears throat> in the Bible, a verse that, that really was life-changing to me several years ago when I was going through a real uh, uh, stressful time, difficult time, trying to juggle two full-time jobs and stress from those two jobs, I was actually in my doctor's office, and uh, he was, you know, we were going over some things, and, and uh, I was showing some signs of stress, and, and uh, he, he said, you know, normally this is the point where I would ask a person, is there something on your job that's stressing you out? But since I know what both of your jobs are, a pastor and a police officer, it goes without asking that question. So, we're just going to try to address um, the stress in your life. And, and uh, I'm thankful to him because instead of trying to throw a medicine at it, he said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk to you about some things in your life. And, and, and he did and began to talk to me about uh, how to manage stress better. It was kind of odd, you know, to have a, a doctor maybe uh, talking to the pastor about those things. But it was very helpful. And it kind of started a journey in my life. It was around that same time that, um, I, actually, I think the day he was talking to me, I, I, I thought about this verse of Scripture, and so it's kind of been a, uh, uh, an anchor since that time when it comes to, you know, just managing stress and, and uh, not, you know, being overwhelmed and, 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 and all that. Uh, it's just been an anchor for me. I want to read it and kind of take off from there. It's Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. It says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. One translation says, all you who are war slap out. He said, when you get there, here's what you do. First of all, you come unto me. Come on, how many of you know? In other words, if you are uh, in your spirit, you're stressed, you're, you know, you're, you're wore out, you're tired, you feel like you're, you, you know, you're, you, you, you just fighting it ever, on every side. He said, that's not the time to take off from me. Quite the contrary, when you find yourself wore out, heavy laden, overcome, you, that's the time that you need to come unto me, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. Come on, it's important to make a note that, that rest is a gift from God. Rest is not something just, or just something that we do physically, Rest is something that God can give you and me as a gift. And then he went on to say this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You know, he's referring to uh, the practice of that in that day and time of using oxen, which they use for pretty much 
for everything they did, you know, out in the fields and physical labor. And when we were missionaries in Mexico, out in the bush, we saw the same thing. They still, to this day, do that. And you would always see uh, two oxen working together, joined together by a yoke. And, and, and what I learned, even in Mexico, uh, you know, asking a lot of questions and watching them use these animals to work, is that there was always a, a bigger, stronger, older oxen on one side of the yoke, and then there was always a young up-and-coming oxen on the other side of the yoke. And when I began to ask them about that, they said, well, the reason is two obviously are better and stronger than one, but it's also a a process where the older oxen is more experienced, he's stronger, he's he's just better at it, and so he carries the majority of the burden, but the younger oxen is yoked to, to that ox, and that's how it gets stronger and how it learns how to be later on that, that, that chief lead oxen. And, and I began to think about how Jesus said, take my yoke, upon, in other words, yoke up to me. Come on, how many of you know he is the senior oxen, the strong, the mighty, the and, and, and he said, and, and you just yoke up to me and learn from me. So that verse really means that, that one of the, I think, the, the, the principle on how we find rest for our souls is we lean on him. Come on, we yoke ourselves to him and we lean on him. And then the second part of that is we learn from him. Come on. And, and so I want to encourage you today. I'm not just talking about physical rest. The title of the message is Rest for Your Soul. I want to talk to you about how to find inner rest because you'll never have physical rest until you truly get spiritual or, or rest in your soul. Come on, how I many you know you can you can take off five days and, and, and lock yourself in a room and decide I'm gonna sleep for five straight days to get physical rest, but if your soul is not at peace. How many of you know you'll spend five days and come out of it and still won't feel rested? So I want to talk to you about how to find rest for your souls. And one of the primary, I think, things that, 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 that we need to understand is that rest for your soul is all about balance. Come on, we need to find balance in our lives. When we were missionaries in Mexico, Angel wanted a shelf built for her kitchen and to put spices on and cookbooks and all that and and, uh, you know, I had some time on my hands because we would spend the first half of our day, I kind of had free time because we would wind up going every evening way out in the bush to preach. And, and so, uh, you know, my work day would start around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And so I told her, I said, hey, I'll build you a bookshelf. I'll never forget the look she gave me because, you know, she thought, you've never built anything in your life. So how hard could it be to build a bookshelf? I need two big boards on the end, a bunch of smaller boards in the middle, nail them together, and ta-da, you got a bookshelf. So I, I built this bookshelf and, you know, and spent several days doing this thing and eyeing it, you know what I'm saying, getting it all right. And, and when I got through with it, it was all put together, set it back against the wall and and uh, she put the first few things on the first shelf, and they just slid immediately all the way down to this end. And uh, she looked at me and said, uh, we have a problem. I said, just keep putting stuff on it. It'll eventually stop. I mean, it, you know, it just. <laughs> what I never did use is one of these things. Now, this is a big level. How many of you know this is, this is uh, I borrowed this level from, from uh, the marshal, actually, and he brought it to the office the other day, and I said, I said, I need to borrow a level, but that's the biggest level I've ever seen in my life. He said, that's for leveling floors. And he said, when you're putting in floors, you better use a level. Come on. I mean, you know, you don't want. But the whole thing about this level is, and if you use one, you know a lot about it. And if you don't, you you may be like me and didn't know. But there's this little bubble. I don't know if you can see that bubble in the middle. But you want that bubble in the middle. Now, if it's level, it, that bubble's perfectly in the middle. You know, okay, now I can nail this together, and it's going or if you're putting up a picture. How I many of you know you don't want a picture on your wall that looks like that? So the way you get it level is you put a level on it, get the bubble in the middle, go, there it is, that's where I'm going to hang it. Well, what I learned is that bubble can be off just a little bit. I was trying to use one of these to level our uh, washing machine one time. Somebody told me, just go get a level, set it on top, 
keep adjusting the feet until the bubble's in the middle. And I got it really close. I mean, it was very close. It was, you know, maybe, I know you can't see it, but, I mean, the bubble was just off to one side a little bit. But I, I kept fooling with that thing, and I finally thought, that's as good as I can get it. And so, you know, I said, that, that's, that's, man, that's level. I mean, the bubble's just off. Of, and we, you know, cranked that washing machine up. And, I mean, you know what happened? It was, had to shut it off. I thought, man, it's not that far off. Well, what I've learned is in our life, balance doesn't have to be extreme, you know, way far off. Sometimes that bubble in your life can be just, just slightly off balance to one side. But here's what I learned. The, the longer you go or the further you build with that bubble off just a little bit, the farther off you get. And, and then if you go, you know, it's a big project, by the time you get through, how many of you know you have a disaster on your hands, even though nowhere along the way were you off that far? And so for our lives, I think we have to realize that because a lot of times we think, man, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, I, I, I you know, and we compare ourselves to others. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? You go, man, I'm not being you know, old, 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 uh, Every time I think of a name, it's one of y'all, so I don't want to use a name, but, you know, but you think, oh, oh, Carlos, man, I mean, look, that dude, he works 80 hours a week, and he, you know, he's never home, I, I'm not like that, I'm just putting in a little overtime, or I'm just, you know, whatever, and, and we compare ourselves to other people. What we need to do is, is we need to be sure that we have a, a spiritual level in our life. And we do everything we can to maintain that little bubble right in the middle so we have balance. So I want to talk to you today about rest for your souls. And, and I did something a lot of preachers do that I don't do very often is I'm going to use an acronym today for rest. Just give you four points on finding rest for your souls. And I'm going to use the word, the acronym rest, R-E-S-T. And each letter, I think, is, it makes a, a very good uh, uh, takeoff point for uh, what I want to share with you. And so I want you to just write that down or take, if you have your app open, you'll see that word rest. And we're going to go through this and just look at each letter. So let's get started. The, the letter R is where we begin. And R to me stands for routine. Come on, somebody say routine. The point is this. I think we all need to learn how to maintain our routine. Now look, in the summer, that's when, how many of you know, your routine gets totally off, and, and you love it. Come on, I hear parents all the time go, man, I thank God it's summer because, I, you know, I don't have to have my kids up so early and ready, and, it, you know, it's just easier. It's, and look, it's always easy to not have a routine, and that's okay when it comes to summer vacation and break. We talk about physically. Sometimes it's good to change up the routine. I get that. But I have learned in my life that, that one of the ways that I successfully manage stress is when I have a routine and I stick to that routine in my life. In Luke chapter 4, it says this about Jesus. When he came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had grown up, he went into the synagogue as he always did on the Sabbath. The King James says, as his custom was. Jesus had a, when, when people looked at Jesus, they knew that Jesus always does the same thing on the same day at the same time. He, he had a custom, he had a, he had a routine, and, and one of the things that I began to, in this discussion with my doctor, I realized as he began to ask me questions, is that I was trying to manage two full-time jobs, a family, you know, all the things that go along with life. And I was doing it without a routine in my life. And I was using the excuse of not having a routine is that I can't have a routine because I'm too busy to have a routine. And I remember saying to him, well, look, Doc, all that sounds great, but I can't do that because I never know what each work day holds on each job. I don't know what my, you know, I'm raising at that time, you know, t girls, teenage girls or, and, and, and you know, and. You know, they're emotional, and every day's different. I, I just don't have any idea what's going to happen. So I just kind of wing life. And he said, if you keep winging life, you're going to wind up ending your life. 
You've got to find routine. And so I began to try to build routine into my life. And, and I want to just go through a few. Look, I'm feeling more of a, a, a pastor flow today. I'm not so much a preachy flow, but a teachy flow. I want to just teach you some things that I think will help you in your life when you want to find rest for your soul. And, and so let me go. There's some routines we need to have in our life. The first one I call is a morning routine. How I many you know you need to have a morning routine? Some of you say, I don't even see morning. Come on, you know what I'm saying? I start in the afternoon. Well, I, look, I've been there. There was a point in my life where I thought, man, I'm so wore out at the end of the day from everything that I'm managing. I'm going to sleep as late as I can in the morning. I'll get up and I'll get started when I feel able to get started. And, and I didn't realize that I was getting further and further and further behind the eight ball in my life. And so I began to develop a morning routine where I get up every morning, and I'm not bragging because, look, it's, I'm just telling you what I think has been helpful to me is that I get up every morning at 6 a.m. Now, some of you get up earlier than that, and, and I admire you. I remember one time Beto had this great idea of having a men's Bible study at 6 a.m. at Cracker Barrel, I think, or Waffle House. I don't remember where, but because I didn't go. <laughs> he told me, hey, we're having this men's Bible study. It's at 6 a.m. I said, well, I'll pray for y'all. Bless you, man. He's like, no, we need you to be there. You're the pastor. I said, bro, I'm not going to be anywhere for breakfast at 6 a.m. I'm just getting out of bed at 6 a.m. Some people I know get up and work out at 4 a.m. before. Look, I admire you. That's impressive. But let me tell you right now, if you ever see me running at 4 a.m., somebody's chasing me, okay? I, but we've got to have some kind of morning routine. And so I began to get up every morning at 6 a.m. because I have to be you know, at work by 8 a.m., and what I found is if I get up at 6, I have time to have coffee, read my Bible, pray a little bit, relax, kind of just, and let me tell you, one of the biggest things that's helped me is not getting up, hitting the shower, dressing, hitting the truck, hitting work without even taking a minute's break. That, that, that will stress you out, but I take some time in the morning and just Try to have a morning routine. And the more that I became successful at having a good routine in the morning, the more my stress level began to drop. Now, the, another routine we need to have is a work routine. And I realize that depends on our job. Some people, you know, you, you, you don't get to choose how many hours you work. But I was reading a statistic the other day, and of course this was probably pre-COVID because we know we're going through kind of a, you know, labor crisis right now, but, but pre-COVID, they said most Americans were working up to 80 hours a week was their normal work week. Now, how many of you understand that's what typically most companies consider a two-week pay period, and they were working it in one week, and we wonder why our families are falling apart, our health is crashing, you know, divorce is up, debt I mean, all those things, a lot of that has to do with work routine. And so I also began to have to build some kind of routine around my work life and say, look, you, you know, I've got to try to manage this. And, and, and so you, you need to do that. Here's another one. You need to have a family routine. Look, if you don't make, you know, some kind of plan for family time and, and how to, you know, build family, you'll find out that family will be on the back burner. And how many of you know the last thing you want to put on the back burner in your life is your family? So we began to try to have some kind of family routine where we would have, when our kids were younger, we would have one night that was family night. We would be sure that, look, we're, gonna, we're not going to do anything that night. There's you know, I'm not going to take phone calls that night. We're going to have pizza, watch a movie. And unless someone is like dying or there's a building burning down that's associated with me, I'm not leaving family night. People would call and say, you know, me and my wife are having a fight and it's pretty bad. We need you to come right now. I'd say, it's family night. I'll get with y'all tomorrow. Well, if you, you know, if you don't get with us tonight, we're going to get a divorce. I'd say, you've been saying that for 20 years. You'll make it. I'll see you tomorrow. Because I learned that, you know, early on, I'd drop everything, leave my family, go. And, and uh, I mean, you know, it just, my family was suffering. And I wasn't doing a whole lot of good where I was going either. Another routine, and this one's tough for us as Americans, is meal routine. 
Man, we need to have a meal routine. Now, this is where I struggle, okay? You look at me and tell, he ain't got that one down quite yet. I had somebody the other day, I was talking to him about, you know, I said, man, I got to get back. I got to get this thing right. I got, and they said, dude, it's simple. I said, well, if it, you got something that's simple, I'm all ears. And y'all have heard this. He said, yeah, in the morning, you eat breakfast like a king. Just eat all you want, eat a big old breakfast. And, and then, you know, at lunchtime, he said, you eat like a, a prince. You know, a little bit less, maybe a salad, a sandwich. And then he said, I, I, your dinner meal, evening meal, you eat like a pauper, just a little bit. Maybe a little salad, a little soup, some fruit. I said, man, I, I might try that. But the only problem is, about 10 o'clock at night, I hear this voice that says, long live the king. Come on. <laughs> a meal routine, though, is helpful, especially in our family. We, we would be sure that we sat down as a family to eat dinner meal together. And look, our girls, it, it didn't matter if your TV show was on, your you know, you were FaceTiming your best friend. It was dinner time. Shut it off. Come sit at the table, and we're all going to sit around the table, and we're going to eat, and we're going to talk, and we're going to spend some time together. And then lastly is we all need a sleep routine. Now, look, this, again, was one of the most difficult ones for me because I'm a night owl. Typically, I would stay up till uh, there was a time in my life, and not that many years ago, that I would never go to bed before midnight, ever. I mean, I just couldn't. It was at midnight I'd start kind of winding down for bed, and somewhere between one or two I'd go to sleep. Well, what I, you know, I, I learned is that there was no wonder I was always running on a sleep deficit and, and tired, and, 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 you know, because so, so I began to, to decide, and, and I kind of set a goal. I think they say, that everyone needs eight hours of sleep. Well, that's kind of difficult for me sometimes with my schedule. I, when I can hit it, I lo and, and usually, by the way, my morning routine of 6 a.m. does not apply to Saturday. I sleep as long as I can on Saturday, which is usually about eight. But still, but what I've learned is I get about nine, nine and a half hours on, on Friday night, which helps. But I decided I've got to have seven hours of sleep a night. And so between 10 and 11, I'm shutting her down and I'm going to bed. Now, here's one of the things you say, well, I just can't do that. You know, I, I tried to go to bed earlier. Here's what I learned. If you'll start getting up at 6 a.m. every single morning, you'll find it easier to go to bed between 10 and 11 o'clock at night. Routines are important for us. And I, I just believe that if we're going to find rest for our soul, we've got to get ourselves into some good habits and good routines. Here's the second one, the letter E. It stands for emotions. Come on, we've got to manage our emotions. Man, listen, one of the things that, that, that destroys our rest is, is when our emotions get all out of balance. Come on, some of us live like this with our emotions, and some of us live like this, you know what I'm saying? Up and down, up and down, man. You ever known somebody like that? I mean, you, you know, one day they're on top of the mountain, God's good, praise the Lord, you know, I'm right along there with Moses, life is wonderful, and the next day they're Job. Come on, you know what I'm saying? That will wear you out. There's a story in Luke chapter 10, you know the story Mary and Martha? Jesus comes to their house to eat. He comes and Martha's, man, she's preparing the meal. She's getting the china. She's setting the table. She's getting it all, all ready. Mary is amazed that Jesus came. And Mary sits down with Jesus the minute he gets there and just starts talking and listening to Jesus. Well, this goes on for an hour or two. It's getting close to dinner time. Martha's looking in from the kitchen. Come on, ladies. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and, and Mary's la her lazy self, she ain't got up out of that chair yet. And I'm doing everything. And Martha went to Jesus. She threw a fit. And here's what Jesus said to her. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Translated, he said, Martha, you're pitching a fit about all kind of stuff. But few things are needed. 
really only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha's emotions were all out of, out of, out of, out of whack. She was upset. She was upset with Mary. But how many know when you get upset with Jesus and you start telling Jesus that he needs to do something about some situation, your emotions are out of balance. Come on, you're out of whack. And she basically went to Jesus and said, don't you care? I'm doing all the work. Mary's not doing anything. You need to do your job, Jesus. I know none of us would ever tell Jesus that, but look. Let me tell you something. And, and, and this, I've just been amazed, but we were talking the other day about how the dispatch calls over the past year, two, few years especially, had, uh, considering road rage, have increased like you would not every day. Multiple radio dispatch calls about some kind of road rage happening right here in our, in, in our city, in our parish. It's unreal. People are so stressed. I mean, fighting at red lights, pulling guns on each other, ramming somebody's car. At, you know, the, the last one we had it in court was sitting in the drive through at Raising Cane's, and somebody got mad in the drive through and rammed the car in front of them. You know why? We're, we, we're not creating and maintaining margin in our life. We're all five minutes behind for the next meeting that we have, and we live stressed all the time. So you got to have some margin in, in your life. Not margin, butter, or margin, margin. Come on, you got to have some space. You got to have it with your time. One of the one, one of the most life changing teachings I sat under in a, in a pastor and leadership conference was a, a, a teaching on time management, learning to manage my time better. Come on, that's hard to do, but we got to do it. We need some margin when it comes to our money. Come on, somebody. We, you know, some people live that, you know, there's not enough money at the end of the month. You know what I'm talking about? And we've got to learn how to budget and have a little margin and say, look, I, you know, I, I got to keep a little bit of space because, you know, if I need a, you know, I have a flat tire and I need a new tire, I don't want it to be. How I many you know there are people who one flat tire pushes them over the edge financially? You say, well, how could that be? Because they have lived on the edge so long. Come on. How many of you know we need to create some margin when it comes to this thing right here? Come on, somebody say phone. Come on, most of us have the iPhone. We are a slave to this thing. I mean, man, I was in a restaurant eating lunch the other day, and there were some people at the table next to me, and this guy was FaceTiming somebody about a business deal they were talking dollars and cents. They were talking profit. And I was hearing everything they were saying. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I know more about your business than, but oh, I got to take this call, man. And, and look, it, I, one of the neatest little things on this little, if you have an iPhone, you can set it to show you once a week what, what it calls your screen time. It'll show how much time you spend on Facebook, Instagram, all those things. You need to use that because you will be amazed. I remember one time I said, I don't get on Facebook that much. I get on to post something, you know, or if somebody tells me, hey, did you see somebody's Facebook? I go, look real quick. I'm not on it that much. And now I began to get my screen time report. I was convicted. I thought, man, look, how many of you know some of us need to get off of Facebook and get our face in the book? Come on, somebody. So we've got to have some margin in our life. We've got, to, we've got to manage our emotions. The third one is this, S, and it stands for Sabbath. Remember, God said, the Sabbath. Hebrews 4 verse 10 says, For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Now listen, you know, we love in, in, in you know, the, the New Testament church, we love to talk about how we're not under the Old Testament law. What we, what we don't like to talk about is where Jesus says, I didn't come to, to do away with the law, I came to fulfill the law. 
If you understand what he's saying, what he's saying is there's nothing wrong with the law except that you can't keep it. How many know God's the one who came up with the law? It wasn't bad. It's just the fact that y'all, I I thought this would, you know, you could do this. You can't. So Jesus comes and fulfills the law. I mean, to say we're not under the law at all would be as crazy as to say I can go kill somebody if I want to, even though it says thou shalt not kill. I'm not under the law. I mean, no, that's just not true. And so when it comes to the Sabbath, he said one of the ten commandments he said was remember the Sabbath, and he said keep it holy. Now, I want to say this. Don't be legalistic with the Sabbath. It's not so much a day. It's a principle for our life. If you read Genesis chapter 2, the creation, it says, By the seventh day God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, God rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So, So God created everything in the universe in six days. He finished. On the seventh day, he rested and didn't create anything, didn't do anything new. And and as he rested on the seventh day, he said, this is good. And he blessed it and made it holy and said, we, from now on, man must have a blessed, holy day that they rest from all the work that they do. Now, now think about this. If God rested on the seventh day, how many of you know, we are smart enough to know God was not tired. It's not like God said, whew, man, that wore me out. I need a break. Man, if he could create, if he could say, let there be light and there was light, he wasn't tired. He didn't rest because he was tired. And you and I don't need to rest simply because we're tired. We need to rest because it's a godly principle. And listen, Many of us would see a different level of success in our, in, our, in our business, a different level of success in our physical health, a different level of success in our marriage relationships and parenting relationships with our children if we would just make up our mind to remember the Sabbath. We, we like to say in the proofs in the pudding. Well, well I, I, I've changed it a little bit and said the proofs in the Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. Do you know Colonel Sanders, KFC, they're open seven days a week. And they profit, they're, they're per franchise, they average $1.1 million a year in profit. Chick-fil-A is open six days a week. I mean, you know, it's not open on Sunday, and some of us get mad about that. My little granddaughters love Chick-fil-A, that's just Chick-fil-A is it. And some Sunday afternoons, we'll be hanging out. and say, what do y'all want for dinner? And they say, Chick-fil-A. I'm like, honey, you can't get Chick-fil-A. Today. It's Sunday. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm mad about that. Well, I am too, but they're not open. They'll be open tomorrow, and we'll get Chick-fil-A tomorrow. They're open six days a week, closed on Sundays. Their average profit per year, $4.4 million per franchise. So you can't tell me that, it look, in business, you can't do that because it just your competitors. Look, you honor God's principle, and guess what? He'll take care of the rest. I love it. There was, uh, you know, uh, an airport that wanted Chick Fil A to come into the airport, but they told Chick Fil A, "If you come into this airport, you got to be open on Sunday." Chick Fil A declined and said, "We just won't come to the airport." They said, "No, you don't understand. This airport is." Super busy, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Man, you'll sell chicken as long as you, much as you. They said, we sell plenty of chicken. We're not coming if we have to be open on Sunday. They got into this standoff, and ultimately, guess what? The airport said, come on, and you can be closed on Sunday because we need your business here. So is it, how does that apply to me? You said, well, I'm not Chick-fil-A. Look, we need to try our best. Now, I understand our work schedules. You know, sometimes that's why I said it's not legalistic. It's a principle but we ought to all try to take two days a week off if possible. If possible, two days a week. One is a personal day off. That's the day that you do all your, what, what we call it up here in North Louisiana, rat killing. You know what I'm saying? You run your errands, you get your hair cut, you go 
repair the fence outside. You, 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 you know, you go do whatever you got to do at Home Depot. And th- that's, that's your personal day. You just take care of stuff you don't get to take care of during the week because you're working. And then that second day, it needs to be a Sabbath. It needs to be a day that we rest. Come on, and we honor God if we can, if you can do it on Sunday or whatever day, you, you know, the, the church is meeting. It's, it's an important day. And then lastly on that, I think everybody needs to take an annual vacation. I believe that's something that we all need to do. Now, some people say, I don't have enough money to take a vacation. Look, let me tell you something. Vacation is not about money. Man, when we were, our, I was telling, we were talking in our pre-service meeting today about how when my girls were little, sometimes we didn't have money to go do this big, you know, we weren't going to Disney World, that was obvious. So we'd find somewhere that had a hotel with a swimming pool, we'd take our girls and we'd say, hey, guess what, we're going to spend three or four days at this hotel, it's a swimming pool, you can swim all day long, all half the night, we can swim, find one, had a, we, we check this stuff, we want one with a pool that's open late, because to our girls, it was nothing like we get to swim at night, like after supper, we get to go out. And then the ultimate was we get to have supper, pizza, out by the swimming pool at the hotel. Greatest vacations in the world. We went to Branson one time on a shoestring budget, and uh, I said, man, we can get there, we can rent a room, we can do Silver Dollar City, but we can't eat. And Angel said, well, honey, we got to eat. I said, well, hang on, I'll do some research. I found this hotel that had uh, peach cobbler and nachos, right? What? And popcorn. In the lobby all day, every day. So I went back to Angel. I said, I got it. We solved the problem. What? I said, we get there and we eat peach cobbler, popcorn, and nachos for seven days while we're in Branson. <laughs> Guess what? Our girls thought it was the best. Best thing in the world. We get to eat peach cobbler and popcorn for breakfast, lunch, and supper. And I just played it up like, hey, I did this for you, baby. I'm telling you, look. <laughs> Man, how many you know taking a break is awesome? Getting away is awesome. It'll, it'll revitalize your marriage. It'll, it'll make your children so much more healthy. And, and, and so we've got we've to gotta remember the Sabbath. And then the last one is this, T. And that stands for trust. Trust in the Lord. Man, we say, how can I find peace? I'm just stressing. I'm struggling. I'm fighting here. I'm I'm trying to put out fires over here, and I don't have enough money here, and my kids are acting up here, and man, what can I do? Isaiah 26.3 says, you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. To trust is the conviction that whatever God decides to do is the right thing. It means being at peace with what he does and what he decides. I mean, you know, I know that's not easy, but if you want to find true peace, get to a place in your life where you say, God, whatever you decide to do about this situation, I'm just going to trust that it's the right thing and that you know what you're doing Better than I know what you should do. Now, that's for, come on, that's easier said than done. One of my favorite hymns is, is an old hymn that it, it is well with my soul. If you research that hymn, the man who wrote that hymn had his wife and kids were on their way to, to spend time with him across the ocean. And the ship capsized and they drowned and died out in the middle of the ocean. Later, he wanted to go and, 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 and see the you know, place where this happened. And, and it was out in the ocean in that very place that he wrote what's become one of the most famous hymns of all times, It Is Well With My Soul. He took out a piece of paper and a pen when, when he was in the very spot where he had lost his wife and child. And he wrote this, When peace like a river attendeth my way, When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. That is what trust is. The ability to say, whatever my lot, it is well with my soul. 
Come on, let me close with Psalms chapter 20, verse 7, and we'll pray. The writer of Psalms was talking about how we trust in so many different things. He said, some trust in chariots and some in horses. If we wrote this today, you could say some trust in the Wall Street and some trust in corporate America. Some trust in, you know, American medical care and some trust in pharmaceuticals. And you could go on and on. But he said, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Come on, would you close your eyes with me? And as you do, I just want to sum it up by saying, the greatest way to find rest for your soul is to learn how to trust in the name of the Lord. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to pray for you this morning. And I believe there's some of you here that you say, man, I'm struggling right now to find rest for my soul. I'm stressed. I've got a lot going on. I want to pray for you today. And I want to ask God to give you the gift of rest. But could we take a moment before we do right now and just do a little soul searching? Come on, if you're here this morning or online with us and you say, man, I, you know, I don't even really know the Lord personally. I, I'm not even walking with God. I'm not really in a relationship with God. I know about him and I believe he exists, but I, I, it's not personal to me. Would you take a minute right now and pray wherever you are and just make that relationship personal? Just tell him, Lord, I don't want to just know about you and I don't want to hear about I want to know you in a personal and intimate way. For many of us who have a relationship with the Lord, maybe we've just had our life out of balance. Maybe our level has the bubble all the way on one end and it's not in the middle. And Maybe the Holy Spirit's convicting you this morning that, hey, you need, to, you need to put a level, a spiritual level to your soul and to your life. You need to put it there. You need to be honest about it. You need to let it show you and reveal what's really going on. And if you're off balance, it may not, you may not be able to see it with the naked eye. But if you'll put that spiritual level to it, the Word, the Holy Spirit, it'll, it'll show you if you're off just a little bit. And, and if that's you, come on, take a minute and just be honest with God and say, Lord, I repent. I'm doing my own self-damage, God. I'm praying for you to do great things in my life, and I'm undoing it by simply... God, not doing the things that can produce that rest for my soul and peace in my spirit. Just take a minute and pray before him. I want to pray over you. If that's you, just as I pray this prayer, just make it your prayer. Say, Lord, I, I receive this in the name of Jesus. Father, we come before you today. I truly believe, Lord, that you desire to give us the gift of rest. Rest for our soul. Peace that passes all understanding. Lord, you truly want to God, give us health in every area of our life. And Lord, I pray that as we begin to put the level to our life and bring things back into balance, I pray that Lord, the Holy Spirit would overwhelm us in our life. That God, you would bring rest to us, Lord, first deep down on a soulish level. That God, deep in our soul, we would find that place of rest and that peace. And as a result, God, our, our mind would be at perfect peace. And Lord, ultimately, our physical bodies would be able to rest. That God, for some of us, we would lay down at night and maybe for the first time in a long time, we'd be able to sleep all night without tossing and turning and waking up with worries and fears on our mind. Lord, we'd be able to lay down at night and say, God, I put it in your hands and, 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 and just receive your gift of rest. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction into our lives so that we would not continue, God, on a course that goes along with culture, 
that throws balance away, God, that sets aside principles and and says, I'm just going to live my life how I want to live it, the way I want to live it, as fast as I want to live it. God, help us to come back, Lord, to a place of balance for those of us that believe your word and want to honor your word in our life, God. And as we do, I pray that we would find rest, God, for our souls. We thank you for it, God, today. Lord, I pray that this word, while it's been, God, more just a teaching and principles, Lord, as a pastor, I believe that, God, it's it's what you wanted delivered, God, today to your people because, God, you're interested in truly aligning our life and balancing our life and leveling, God, our life into a place where, God, your peace can truly penetrate the depths of our soul. We thank you for that today, God. We receive that rest and that peace right now. Come on, take a minute before I close. Just receive it. Just tell him, Lord, I'm receiving rest and peace right now. I believe he can gift it to you right here, right now. And then as you go, just put the principles in place and practice and allow that peace to fill your heart, mind, your life, your home, your children. God, it will penetrate and affect every area of our life as we receive it now. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand to your feet before we are dismissed. I'm going to, if you're giving in person... Now would be a time to go ahead and fill out that envelope that's in the seats there located around you. And on the way out, there's some boxes on the wall in the back, both here in the auditorium and out in the foyer. Feel free to drop it in there. Also, if you're a guest here in person with us, fill out a Connect card there in the seats as well or by the boxes on your way out and drop that in. We want to follow up with you and know you were here today and just be able to connect with you. If you have a prayer request, that's also a great way to communicate that prayer request to us. I want to mention a couple things that are coming up very important. This Wednesday night in our midweek Bible study, we're starting a brand new study called Killing Kryptonite. And uh, you can check that out. All you got to do is Google it. It's a book by John Bevere. It's great. It talks about the things that, if you're familiar with the story of Superman, you know all about the kryptonite. There are things in our lives as Christians that zap us of our strength and our power. And we're going to spend several weeks in that on Wednesday nights right here at 630 Feel free to join us, even if you hadn't been coming. If you want to get the book, it's not required. You can do that and check it out. You can get it on any any of the platforms out there. And so uh, that's going to be a great midweek Bible study. And then, hey, we're doing a water baptism in the next couple of weeks, actually. And uh, we'll be announcing the exact Sunday date uh, in the next couple days. If you need to take the next step in water baptism, you say, well, I don't know if I need to or not. If you've not done water baptism since you committed your life to Christ or recommitted your life to Christ uh, you need to take that step it's a very important step in our spiritual growth and we can explain more about that if you want to take a connect card or text us and say hey I need to know more about baptism or I want to be water baptized we need to hear from you as soon as possible so can we can make preparations uh, to do that so be sure and remember those things. Very important. We'll be trying to remind you of it also. And then, again, one great way you can keep up is on our app. Feel free to download that in your app store. It's Tithely and that Tithely app. And then once you download Tithely, all you do is search for Life Church, And our personal app will come up, and you can keep up. We try to not bombard you with text, but let you know of important things coming up. And also, it's a great just bank of information about our church there, everything from sermon notes, follow along with me on Sunday to, as Beto mentioned earlier, you can give online, which is what our family started doing. It's a simple click or two. It's secure, and uh, that's a great way to do that as well. So remember those things that are very, very important. Let me pray over you today as we're being dismissed. Just pray God's favor and blessing and protection over all of us as we go this week. Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness in our life. 
We thank you for your blessing, God, in our life. Lord, we thank you that you're not only one who meets our needs, but God, you go above and beyond that so that we can be generous and bless others. And so, Father, today we pray in Jesus' name, Lord, as we go out today, that you would continue to bless us so we could be a blessing to others. We pray for favor, God, over everyone who goes this week. Favor with God, favor with man. Lord, we pray for protection and health and life. Lord, over us, over our children, over our homes and families, and ultimately, God, over our community, we pray, Lord, for your blessing and your protection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for coming.